All right. Hey, there's Tony. There Good I am. Good morning. Oh, hey, it's 1130. We're starting right on time. We're recording. Uh, quick uh, in intro class today, as I was telling Richard, is all about winning in multiple offer situations. We did this probably 10 months ago, Tony, but a lot of agents have reached out and said, hey, I don't know what to do. And so uh, I've got a list today of about 15 things you can do to improve your chances in multiple offers. Uh, so let's do intros. That's the teaser. The intros, I'm Mike Ferrante with Century 21 Homestar, 21 Mike team, been in the business about 12 years as an agent and gosh, more years than I care to count just in the real estate field. I run a team of about 30 agents doing over 300 transactions a year, uh, top 10 for Century 21, the last, what, about six or seven years running, I think, Tony. That's so, right. That's my resume and that's why, you know, Tony has asked me to do these classes. Uh, Tony Geraci, broker owner, Century 21. Uh, he's always available for coaching and training. And Tony, why don't you tell us how we reach you and how available you are? Well, text messages are always best. 216-374-1269. Uh, and uh, I organize myself by that. <laughs> Very good. Sometimes you. get all the voicemails uh, quick enough. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're always so quick to respond to text. And guys, if you need to reach me, it's mike at 21mike.com. And by the way, I always forget to mention this. I'm going to hang out after the meeting for a few minutes in case anyone has questions because we usually keep everybody on mute, uh, but inevitably someone's got a question or two. So I'll hang out for a few minutes when we're done with the training. Uh, but Tony, again, today's uh, today's topic is is all about winning in multiple offers. And I, and I made quite an extensive list. It's, it's about... Uh, a third bigger than the last time we did this. And so let's just dive right in because we have an awful lot to cover, uh, but we know what it's like out there. Your buyers are losing houses and multiple offers. So what can we do? I've actually made the list chronologically from you know starting with working with the buyer all the way through to uh, winning or losing at the end. So the first thing I think that's so important and it's important in our business in general, it's setting ex expectations. I think that Many buyers and sellers know the state of the market, but not everybody does. You know, so first of all, if we don't set the correct expectation when we start working with our clients, hey, it's tough out there. And this is what's happening. You know, I think that what happens is they see a house they like and they say, well, you know, let's keep looking. And I think if they don't understand the state of the market that they're going to make that mistake once or twice, you don't want them to learn the hard way. So, so much of what we do, Tony, in our business is setting expectations. Oh, exactly. Right. And uh, I see uh, if you don't understand this and get in, in, and grow with uh, multiple offers, I, I see people losing buyers because after you, lo you lose a couple of uh, transactions, that the buyers might lose uh, faith in your ability. You mean they might blame us, Tony? What? Yes. <laughs> right. Okay. And so then, go ahead. Go, let's, let's dig into it. Yep. All right. Next step. And I say this with a little bit of hesitation because I know as a listing agent, you know, I, it's tough to field all the calls, but I think once your buyers have identified a property, it's so important to try to consult with the listing agent. Now I know the objection is, well, listing agents are busy. They don't get back to me. They won't give me the information I need, but I think it's really key to try to find out what the hot buttons are from the listing agent and also just make them aware that an offer is coming or and follow up to make sure that they've received it. But we talk a lot about all these different factors that we're gonna list. And obviously price is usually the most important one, but not always. There are gonna be other factors we're gonna talk about that we can work into our offers. And if you can find out what the hot buttons of the sellers are and appeal to those hot buttons, it's gonna give you a leg up when writing an offer when you're in multiples. Uh, the other thing is about being first, you know, getting there quickly. You know, we guys, you know, we all work very hard at our jobs, but we know that, you know, on day three, it may already be too late. Um, and so we need to be ready to ready and organized to get people into houses quickly. Uh, and that includes your out of town buyers. Tony, last uh, was it last week or two weeks ago, we did a class about uh, virtual offers, you know, writing offers sight unseen. And, you know, the stats were pretty amazing. It's around 50% nationwide, 50% of buyers are writing offers without actually seeing the home. 
So if your buyer's out of town and they're waiting till this weekend when they come in town to see the house, you're probably going to miss out. So go back and watch that class about writing offers sight unseen because there are ways that we can familiarize people with homes enough so that they can actually write an offer. Right. Yep. That's good. Yep. Um, the virtual showing, the you know, getting there first, be be first or lose out. You know, that was kind of the motto. Um, and then, of course, submitting the offer quickly. And I think everyone is probably using electronic signatures, but I, I rewatched our class from 10 months ago, Tony, and you talked about uh, if you have to if you have to write an offer in, you know, written, you know, there are some best practices. Do you, do you remember what you talked about? You know, I think you talked about making sure it's nice and neat and legible. Oh, right. No, and, and in order <laughs> and not pieces, parts. You got to make things as easy as possible. You got to sell it to the other agent. Right. And then the other tip was if you do have to write an offer on the spot, you know, use your phone and get a scanner and be able to send it right on the spot. If you're waiting until you go home and scan it and then email it to the agent, those couple hours, you, you might be missing out. So if you don't, if guys, if you don't have a scanner on your phone, get one, scan it on the spot, send a copy directly to your buyer and then send it directly to the listing agent and follow up with a text or an email with, to the listing agent saying, I just sent an offer, please acknowledge re receipt. You know, so right. important that we get in first and verify that our offer has been received. Exactly. Next one, Tony, you, you had some good points on this one last time. It's, it's how the offer is, is written, you know, and it's not just a matter of filling in the price and all that. You know, we, we want to make sure that you're writing the offer in a manner that it looks like it was written by a competent agent who's going to be good to work with. Um, filling in all the blanks, the inspection dates, the, uh, you know, all the contingencies checked. There's nothing worse than getting a contract where half the boxes aren't checked. You know, mm -hmm. how, as a listing agent, when you get a poorly written contract, what do you think? Oh, right. No, it's just not fun to go through that, you know, when you're a listing agent, you go through that, trying to legible, you know, things missing, initials missing, this missing, and it just, it's, it's a bad experience. And, and then uh, uh, I don't want to go, uh, I'll talk about my topics after you're done through your list. <laughs> okay. Well, and please chime in as you always do. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, and w you know, we, we talk about on our team, part of our uh, mission statement is to present ourselves in a way that other agents want to work with us. So I've been in multiple offer situations where the listing agent actually reached out to me and said, Mike, I'd love to work with you again. And just that extra dialogue that we get because we do a good job in collaborating with other agents, I think it helps our, our clients. So presenting yourself and your client in the best light possible is gonna give you a leg up when you're dealing with the listing agent. Exactly. No, let me expand on that. Is that as a broker and talking to agents uh, every day and helping them, coaching them, I'm hearing more and more uh, agents are coming across each other. They're uh, getting a reputation, good or bad. Uh, and so you always got to think about that when you're a buyer's agent and going with the listing, especially, you know, we know that there's more, uh, the listings are more condensed with a, a smaller group of agents. You know, the teams, the companies, offices, you see that. Uh, and if, if you're going to have another offer with these, you have to be professional. And, you know, I went, I train and coach agents every day. I said, you got to treat others like you want to be treated. <laughs> so it, you, you've got to make sure you get, it, it'll hurt you. I have, uh, we have several of our agents now, not put you on the spot, Mike, but being in the business, uh, as long as you have, you have, uh, a, I don't like to work with these people as much as other people list, right? Not, <laughs> but, uh, you never admit that Tony, but yeah, you know, and you never said not as much that you right. wouldn't don't. <laughs> right, You're like, right. wow, that agent is very friendly. Uh, it's very helpful. Is uh, there? And yes, I have agents that are. Uh, I mean, they're not going to hurt their seller over. But if they have two offers identical, they're going to pick the agent that they enjoy working with more. It's just yeah. easy. And I've had agents explain to their sellers. You know, they're uh, consulting them. Well, I had a deal with this agent once, and it fell apart. You know, and we we the buyer backed out. And the pre-approval was bad. You know, you, you get a reputation for that. It could hurt other buyers. So, That's right. Uh, the You have to remember the listing agent is really the only one with the ear of the seller. So every experience that you have with that agent is going to influence 
what what the possible outcome is. Um, okay, so I already mentioned following up to verify receipt. The last thing you want to have to go to your buyer and say is, gosh, I sent the offer, but they've already chosen an offer, and for some reason they didn't receive it. So verifying receipt of the offer is so key, even though you might feel like you're being a little bit of a pest. Uh, and again, as a listing agent, I get it. You know, you want to make sure your offer has been received. Uh, now, let, let's talk a little bit about the actual process of writing the offer and some tools and strategies we can use to make it better. Now, obviously we talk about price. That's the number one factor. In our last session, Tony, you had a real good uh, bit that you did about value compared to price. So obviously you wanna encourage your buyers to come in with a very strong offer and not mess around with, well, we would pay this, but you know, let's come in a little lower and see what happens. There's no time for that anymore. Uh, and so especially when there's multiples, here's a question that you can use that I use uh, with buyers. I'll say, Tony, if I called you tomorrow and told you that you missed out on this house by $1,000, would you be upset or would you be okay with that? So a lot of times they'd say, oh man, $1,000, yeah, I probably would have gone $1,000 higher. It kind of gets their brain working in that way and also setting the expectation that I might be calling you tomorrow to tell you you missed out on this house. And if you knew it was by $1,000, would you be upset? So it gets them really to engage in that what's my best offer conversation. Now, Tony, your, your thing about value last time we did this, you were talking about how a sale changes value, et cetera. And so getting buyers off of thinking about, well, the this Zillow says this, or the tax appraisal says this. Can you elaborate on that? Like how to have a conversation with a buyer about the actual value of a house and how quickly it can change? Yes, no, I love having these conversations and helping agents with this is that uh, uh, value, we have no idea what the, your house value will be five years from now. Uh, we don't have any idea what will be next year. We know it's gonna be consistent. I mean, for historical uh, data, it's gonna be consistent and hopefully it'll stay the same or go up. But putting a value on it today within reason, I, and I tell a buyer a little role playing, so I, I make sure you're not, you're not gonna overpay, like way overpay for this, like you're uh, obscene, uh, you know, too high but you're gonna be within reason of, of value of this. Also, I, I explained to uh, agents that when people are getting a, a pre-approval and getting numbers from their loan officer, ask them this, you go, ask your loan officer, what's the difference in payment if you bought a house $1,000 more? It's gonna be less than five, right now, $5 a month difference. And not to compare buying a house to buying a car, but when you buy a car, no one taught, they never taught, you see an ad, but you don't even know what the price of the car is. You see the payment on that. And I know there's buyers out there that, that would go, wow, I, you know, I didn't want to pay $10,000 more, but I'll, I'll, be, I'll be happy to pay $50 more a month to get the house that I want uh, on there. So, and then also I've been saying this, uh, that you can't, I promise you, you won't overpay for this house because we have, we have checks and balances. The appraisal is going to come. So if the appraisal doesn't come in, you're, you're not going to get loan approval. Uh, as long as the listing agent doesn't write in there, that you have to cover the difference. You know, that's a whole nother class. Yeah. Well, but, no, we're going to get to that. Oh, good. Okay. So that's yeah. uh, one of the things is just that your, your bank's going to double check that you're not overpaying. <laughs> and then yep. we could address it there and that. So I don't know. Does that help? Uh, yeah. I, yep. I didn't want to put too much of the, I go on for 45 minutes about that. <laughs> <laughs> right. But it's important to have the, you know, just because the list price is here doesn't necessarily mean the price isn't going to sell for more. There's a difference between price and value. And as a buyer, you have to really understand what is this house worth to you and come in with your best foot forward, which leads me to escalation clauses. I think by now, most of us have at least heard of them. And I, and I think I said last time, I'm not a big fan. I don't like escalation clauses for various reasons. The biggest one is that basically you're telling a seller, hey, I'd pay this, but not if I don't have to. So I'm going to offer this with the escalation clause up to this number. I think sometimes they can come across as disingenuous. A seller might feel offended by them. Plus, you're telling the seller what your best offer is. Why not just come in with that with that number? So yeah, no, I, I, and if it's your buyer, please don't use them. It's confusing sellers. Just had an agent yesterday was talking to, he couldn't get his sellers to take an he took an offer 5,000 less because it didn't have an escalation clause and he was just confused and didn't understand well, what does that mean and I have to show him an offer just just take this one it's simpler and uh yeah there's the people 
losing out because the escalation clause is confusing. And there's no standard escalation clause. So if you get five offers and four of them have escalation clause, they're all these four different documents that the agents are trying to present to a seller. They're like, just forget it. <laughs> right. Let's now, in the very beginning of our session, you mentioned about how we could potentially lose clients because of different things happening. One of those things is not educating our buyers. So while I'm saying and you're saying, hey, there are potential downsides to escalation clauses, we as agents have to be prepared to explain these things to our buyers because if they meet another agent who says, well, I just got my buyer a house using an escalation clause, and the reply from that buyer is, well, I've never heard of an escalation clause. My agent never told me about it. That's a problem. So we have to be ready to talk about it, even though you may guide your buyer into saying, maybe this isn't the best plan, but this is a tool that is available. And Mike, Amanda had a question. It's like explaining an escalation clause. So the short uh, explanation is it's a, a, a addendum saying that uh, like, you want to offer $250,000 for a house, but you'll go up to 260 and it says, I'll go $1,000 over the next highest bid, the uh, next highest offer, and they're asking for a show proof of the other offer, and they'll go a, a thousand over it. So that's explanation. But Amanda, we could talk, you know, more in detail about that and show you a, a form if you want. Yep. So as I mentioned, I will hang out uh, after the class. And also, Tony and I have done a class about escalation clauses. We have a full half-hour explanation. If you go to Mike Ferrante, Cleveland Realtor on uh, YouTube, you can find that video. And if you like the content, sub subscribe. But we have a full explanation of escalation clauses there as well. Um, OK, so we got a roll here. We're about halfway through, and I'm not halfway through the list. So um, the next one is. <laughs> This is a great idea. So Tony, we talked about raising the price and being worried about appraisals. So sometimes if we pay a number, the seller might say, that's great that you're offering this high number, but I'm worried that the appraisal is not gonna come in. Maybe I'm gonna take this more realistic offer. Okay, so this is a legitimate concern from sellers because now and again, we're seeing appraisals not come in. I just saw this idea and I think it's absolutely brilliant if your buyer has enough cash. So you know how we've been writing offers for years where the seller pays buyer closing costs, right? Mm -hmm. Essentially, if you're paying $250, but I want the seller to pay $5,000 of my costs, really that's only $245. What if you wrote in an offer that you could pay some seller costs? The buyer pays the seller costs. That's if you have enough cash. You're actually increasing the net to the seller without increasing the need for a higher appraisal. Um, this is something I haven't seen this yet but I was reading about it in one of the groups I belong to and I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Tony, any holes you can poke in that? I, I thought it was a pretty cool idea. No, and then explaining that. So, I mean, one minute sales pitch to the listing agent, like, listen, uh, you know, listen, Mike, I got a buyer very motivated. They're, they're ready to go. Uh, we'll, we'll even pay if the appraisal comes in low, we'll go, we'll, we'll make sure we uh, pay the difference. I actually have a, a letter from the lender saying it's okay from the lender. So the lender knows if you've ever been through this, you know, and then you, you educate them too. You could tell them, hey, you know, you may have had this happen before where people say they'll pay the difference, but didn't get the lender approval and the loan got denied. So that might not have happened to the listing agent, but you put doubt. You're like, oh, ooh, there's doubt there. Someone else said they'll pay the difference, but they didn't get their lender approval. Uh, this offer does. So you got to right. sell it and get a hold of the agent and say, I'll pay the seller's closing costs. And again, it, no one else is doing that <laughs> and puts you ahead. Like it'd be anything. I'll pay a thousand dollars. I'll pay $500. It could be anything, but it just puts right. a little, actually this, this person really wants the house. Yep. It's those little differentiators. So you mentioned appraisal and paying the difference. Let's talk about that. Uh, so, it's oh. risky. Many of these things we're going to talk about are risky and you have to be able to explain the risk to your client. So saying, look, I won't worry about the appraisal. I don't care what it appraises for. I will still buy the house. That's risky because what if it's 250 and the appraisal comes in at 220? Now suddenly your buyer has to kick in possibly 30 grand extra to make the loan work. But I would consider at least having a threshold saying, yeah. look, I'll pay 250. And as long as the appraisal comes in at 240 or more, we're good to go. It gives that seller a little security in knowing that there is a cap that even if it comes in a little low, I still have my buyer on the hook. Because what is the buyer fear? Well, one of their biggest fears is that deal falling through, right? 
oh, now I got to put my house back on the market, endure 20 more showings, you know, go through that whole process again. So everything we can do to make the seller feel more secure is going to benefit your buyer. Exactly. Exactly. Um, let's talk about, you mentioned pre-approvals. So mm -hmm. we know that sometimes our buyers come to us with pre-approvals and sometimes these are the uh, internet lenders or lenders that we've never heard of can make sellers nervous. So being able to convey the strength of the pre-approval, especially if they're what's called desktop underwritten, and I don't want to get too much into that, but that's where they've already kind of gone through the approval process. And the only condition left is a verification of income at the very end and an appraisal. So the stronger the pre-approval, the better. And if it's you know, you don't want a pre-approval from Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe lenders, right? You want someone, you know, that the seller is familiar with and that the listing agent will make the seller feel comfortable with that. Uh, Tony, I know you deal with a lot of different lenders and have seen this. Oh. Any other tips on that that you can give? Uh, yes. Uh, you, you really got to help uh, your buyers pick a lender that has a fear of loss in business. Uh, so what I mean by that is that le uh, most loan officers and uh, local mortgage companies and, and banks are, are, you know, they're looking for business, not just calling a number and calling a place because they have no fear. Uh, they, they just pick up the phone. They're getting calls in. I'm not mentioning any companies in general because some of them are good, but, but it, I see it all the time, uh, at least once every other day I have an agent calling me, there's a problem with the loan. It was supposed to close today or tomorrow. They didn't, the lender didn't tell them about the money they needed to have in the bank and season funds and not spend any money. And they're right on the edge of credit. Don't do anything, you know, things like that. And uh, when you're putting an offer in, when it's our listing, if I have two offers, I tell the agent, you know, which one should I pick? I go, who's the, who are the lenders? I go, I've never even heard of this company. Where are they? And they're like, well, they're in another state. I'm like, no, I want someone here. You know, yeah. I mean, if I would suggest to my seller. So ha just having a, a pre-approval from a company that someone's heard of or knows who they are, and especially a loan officer, helps your buyer. Yeah. It, it, some buyers think, well, no, it's my choice. I go, yeah, it's your choice, but it's your choice to... Uh, it's a seller's choice if they want to accept that you're getting a pre-approval from, you know, some company somewhere in Kansas, you know, so. Right. So not that those are bad, but you no, at least right. have to have that conversation with your client so they understand how the seller may view it. That's, that's what have, we're trying to say here. How might have, the seller look at this? I have loan officers calling listing agents to help their buyers out, calling them up, say, hey, this is a real pre-approval. These people are good to go. I'm going to be on top of this. And then, because if you've ever had a deal, you have a bad loan officer uh, communicating, it, it could ruin the whole deal. Uh, so I've, it's just loan officers helping get offers approved. Great. Let's change gears to cash now, money. Mm -hmm. First of all, you know, obviously cash is king. So if they're able to pay with cash, that's awesome if they're financing, but could back it up by saying, look, I don't need the financing contingency because if for some reason we're not approved, we have cash. Cash is king, at least ask the question. Another topic of cash is earnest money. Raising the earnest money amount could differentiate an offer. You know, Explain that whole process to your buyers that that still goes toward the purchase, but just having a higher earnest money amount can be a difference maker. Now, this is uh, something that you have to really stress the risks of, but you could also make the earnest money non-refundable. Very risky move, and you have to explain that to your, to your buyers. But again, if you're looking to make a difference, if they're certain they want the house, uh, they could make it non-refundable or non-refundable after a certain point. You know, Once we've cleared inspections, we'll make it non-refundable. These are just ideas, guys. Again, some of these things are risky, and you have to, but if you don't at least talk with your buyers about it, they don't know what all the options are and they might feel like you're not doing the best job possible. Yep, higher earnest money is definitely good. Um, let's see. That's, uh, I was, and I was gonna say just a quick side note on this is that if you have any listings that are investment pro properties, you know, in a certain price range you're getting investments, I'm hearing more of this. Uh, I just had two of yesterday was, uh, 
uh, people, investors putting cash offers in, but they're not really cash. They're getting hard financing somewhere. They put cash on there because they're getting the cash. They don't understand that. So as listing agents, you got to ask these questions. Is this really cash <laughs> uh, or not? Okay, now let's switch gears from financing and money to the other terms. Okay, the other terms that might be really important to sellers and you won't know if you don't ask, closing dates, possession dates, move out, all that kind of stuff. If you're flexible, if your buyer's flexible, you know, maybe all things being equal, or even if your offer is a little lower, if you can give the seller more time to move out, they might go with you instead of a higher offer. So it's at least a conversation to have. If you can't get a hold of the listing agent or they won't tell you if those things are important to the seller, write that in. So you could say closing date of X, but right in right there, buyer is flexible. You know, we'll let the seller pick the closing dates. I mean, write that in guys, because the seller might look at that and say, well, what does this mean? You mean they'll give me uh, 60 days? Well, it sure right. seems like it. And that might appeal to the seller plus the rent back period. You know, maybe you close in 45 days, but what if you offer the seller two weeks before they had to move out? Again, it could be really, really valuable to a seller. Right, exactly. Another little cool idea I saw was, you know, what what's the seller's biggest fear? You know, one of the seller's biggest fears might be the same problem your buyer's having is where are they going after they sell their house? So that's why this whole closing date, possession date thing is so darn important. Uh, mm -hmm. A little creative idea I saw though, is uh, a little perk that could set you apart is what if you or the buyer offered to pay for the final cleaning? You know, again, just a cute little idea, but it might be a difference maker. You know, they know the last thing they got to do, the last thing they want to do after moving and packing that truck and getting out is come back and clean the house. What if you took care of that item for the sellers? Right. Kind of an no, interesting, no. cute idea. In that same vein, another little cool idea I, I saw were gifts. Now we have to be careful here and I would make the gift from the buyer, but you know, something like a bottle of champagne, you know, uh, leaving that uh, on the showing and saying, we love your house, hope to do business with you and toast to, you know, our new beginning here, leaving a love letter, you know, and, and one of the, so we all know what the love letters are, right? That's where the buyer writes a letter talking about, you know, how much they want the house and that they, they, they love it and how, you know, hey, we're a new family, just had another baby. And, you know, it might pull on the heartstrings of the sellers. And a cool twist to this that I saw was a love letter either from the kids or from the dog, for example. I just thought that was cute. And again, we're looking for ways to stand out here. Right, exactly. And you always got to tell your buyers, uh, if the sellers are around, keep your comments to a minimum. You know, uh, uh, we had one seller a couple years ago uh, overheard a buyer uh, making fun of their decoration. They, they killed the offer over that and sold it to the next person at a lower price. <laughs> so See, just because they offended the seller. And, and isn't that interesting, Tony, because we all think it's all about the money. So it's not necessarily always about every last dime. It could be about some of these, these other things. Now, one piece of advice uh, I have for you regarding the love letters is I would try to make it all about the house and, you know, having a new kid, we need that fourth bedroom, you know, and I, and I don't recommend including pictures. Um, I would just make it a very uh, emotional kind of appeal about how we love the neighborhood. We love the house and make it more about the sellers than it is about the buyers, you know, make them try to connect in some way. Yep. I like that. Um, there was another idea. This is getting tougher and tougher these days, but we have Zoom presenting an offer in person. It's something you could try. Again, it's not practical in a lot of uh, times, but sometimes presenting an offer in person where we can actually take the time to explain. So Tony, our last class, you talked about, well, gosh, most, if you've got five offers, the first thing you do is look at the price. And if your price is a little lower, they might just go, well, forget that one's out. Um, can, can you elaborate on, on that, Tony, you know, ex explaining how, how you explain an offer to a listing agent so that they at least make it past that price line? Right. No, just kind of pull out and point out the positives or not really the negatives, but what's most important uh, to your buyers and what hopefully will be uh, uh, important to the sellers. 
uh, like example, if people take a, a, a little lower price because they know these people are going to, are, are well qualified and they're going to go through with it, you know, and they have a higher earnest money, maybe a higher down payment. I get that question a lot. Like, why does it matter how much money the, the buyer puts down and why we have that on the contract? I'm like, it doesn't, yeah, in theory it doesn't matter. So the price of the house, but if someone's putting 25, 30% down, uh, the good pre-approval letter uh, might be more realistic. You know, it's it, you're rolling the dice. If someone comes in way too high, low down payment, barely qualified from a lender you don't know, it's a little bit of a risk there. Uh, you have 30 days and all of a sudden everything falls apart. So right. it's the you're more secure buyer might be, you know, you know, the best bet. Right you're trying to satisfy the fears of the seller. And by doing those things, that's what you're doing. You're, you're diminishing those fears. I've got two more quick ones here, guys. I know we're at time. The next one is offering to accept or possibly buy contents in a house. Sellers don't want to be hassled with moving stuff. You know, so offering to say, look, I see you have a lot of stuff in the garage. We'll take care of that. Leave it. Yeah. That's a great idea, I thought. And then the last, the last one I have here is if all else fails, put yourself in a good backup position. So I know a lot of us say, well, we're not going to leave it as a backup offer, but how many times do we see it, Tony? The first offer, that one that came in really high and they took it just without thinking, it falls through. So put your buyers in a good backup position, make it a backup offer for X amount of time where the seller could say, oh man, I can't believe that deal fell through. Now I got to go through this process again. What am I going to do? And the list agent says, well, wait a minute, we have that backup offer. And maybe they even signed it as a backup offer. Right. No, stay, things fall apart. Just stay, stay close, be nice. <laughs> Don't get upset because your offer didn't get, because you might get a second chance at it. That's right. Don't burn that bridge with that list agent. You know, don't give them a hard time because, you know, they you feel like maybe there was something done that was unfair. You know, you can't don't burn the bridge for your buyer. Right. Exactly. We are at time, guys. So I'm going to hang out for a few minutes. Uh, don't forget, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, sub subscribe to our channel. You can catch up on past episodes. Tony, I know you got to run. You've got another class to do, uh, but I'll hang around for a few minutes in case anyone has has questions. All right. Thanks, Mike. See, See you, Tony. everyone. Bye bye. Thanks. Hey, Mike. Hey, Richard. Richard. Um, so I've been in the habit, especially with investors, but also owner occupants to use the escalation clause. I just thought it was a great way 